So, phase one of this deal with the shank replacement and the addition of the wear bars is done. And we took care of that repair. The thin spot there above that above that wear bar. Now inside here on the shanks, we fixed those cracks and and I did uh, add a couple passes of weld in the area where uh, where I found those cracks on it. But I didn't fill it so full of weld that you know you couldn't you couldn't find the edge of the shank. Um, if I needed to burn one of these shanks off, it wouldn't be that that big of a deal. And, and these hard shanks are are protecting uh, you know that that softer weld metal because they're you know the way they come they're so beveled. You got plenty of room to put weld under them, and that weld's not gonna not going to wear off until this really hard shank material is all gone. Uh, so, you know, that part of the work uh, used the, the straight head, long straight, long straight torch with a scarf and tip, uh, long 90 torch with a scarf and tip, long 90 torch with a big cutting tip. Um, Ran an eighth inch 7018, 532 7014, uh, 316th 7014, 316th 7024, quarter inch 7024. Um, ran some arc 8050s. Now that's a pipeline rod you wouldn't normally use on a bucket, but I tell you, you get in situations sometimes where there's a really uh, tight. Uh, really tight area to reach in and, and you need some weld and you know with a low hydrogen electrode or or a jet rod uh you'd almost have to gouge more out to get that rod in there to make it work but with uh with the with the 50 pipeliners or uh even a different size pipeliner arc 80s i'm not afraid to reach in there with that and hit it with two or three passes of the pipeline rod and then and then go over it, uh, you know, with a with a structural rod because that thing will dig back in there, man. It'll get right back in there. Use the carbon arc, uh, carbon rods, the cans that I completely emptied. These, when they're full, are about 14 pound a rod. Uh, went through uh, 42 pound uh, of those those electrodes. Um, uh, used a spool of the ER70 S6 wire. Um, sometimes first pass with the MIG, uh, with the Millermatic 252 and, and the mixed gas. Uh, we used to have the 7525, but I think this is a, uh, 16 CO2 and the remainder is argon. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's what air gas calls their gold gas, uh, gold gas. Uh, anyway, the next phase of this deal is going to be uh, dealing with this thin area behind where it was previously plated. I'm going to try and show you with my light how how rough this is. And when I say rough, I mean it's it's very much not flat. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of people would say. Hey, uh, get some hard plate and lay in there and weld it in there and plate it. Um, I'm not crazy about doing that on something this rough because you're going to get in that situation we were in with this, with this, the way they did this plate. You know, we found out that that, that plate, when, when I blew through there and found that gap, and this plate right here isn't even contacting the metal that it, that it plated over. Uh, to me, that sucks. Um, and and another thing, when if if you start laying plates in something that's that bumpy, I mean, if you laid in it, if you laid some kind of straight edge, even a short straight edge up on there, you'll find places where you'd have a gap under it that's like three quarters of an inch. It's that bumpy. Um, if you start laying plates in there, those are going to be plates that you're going to struggle like hell to get them welded because there's really no way to fit them good. And even if you do, 
uh, just go and 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 plate it and and weld it up, you're going to have parts of your plate that are poking out. You know, and it's not going to be smooth, and that actually increases the amount of wear you're going to get in your bucket. I think. Now, if we was to look uh, with X-ray vision and see where the end of that plate is that they had put in this thing, it would be about right here. So, uh, you know, from, no, it's actually here. Yep, there's the hole, there's the one that's welded up. So, the end of that plate would be about right there. So we're going to want to cut it completely off somewhere about here. But we want to keep these wear bars. Because obviously if you, if you look at the wear bars on the bucket. Other than a little bit of wear on the edge. These are good wear bars. So that's my plan. Um, pretty much I'm going to. I'm thinking I want to. I want to take this out. This inside of this part out. I'll put the wear bars back on. Got plenty of hard ox left to put inside there. And that's what I'm going to do. So. Let's do it. So between the torsion and the carbon arcing, I got that wear bar all fair. And uh, that that also fell out of it. Couple uh, couple of hunks of plate with holes in them. That's a grouser bar for a dozer track. <laughs> I wonder if there's any Budweiser cans in there. <laughs> All right. Moving on.
It's not perfect, but it's a lot more gooder than it was. It'll work. So, cut that wear bar off to get access to where I needed to make the cut on the inside of the bucket plate that, that, that they added there uh, in a previous repair. And that's where we found they had, uh, they must have had a really poor fit when they put that plate in there and they put some pieces of mild steel and a hunk of grouser bar and things in there to get that welded. Uh, but I had to cut that, I had to cut that wear bar off to get in there and, and make the cut that I needed to make here. So we got that taken care of. And then, um, of course, got rid of this thin section of the bucket. Um, and this had a pretty bad bow in it. That was about, I don't know, five eighths or three quarters of an inch in the center. Uh, it was bowed in pretty bad. So I pressed that out and I uh, got some braces in there. The braces can stay in there until this outer section is welded. Now the way, the way this, uh, could be done is, uh, you know, you, you can have my steel supplier, uh, could roll me a, a piece of bucket liner in that shape like that. I'm not doing that in this case. Uh, I'm going to do this in, I'm going to do this in sections and weld it together. Uh, not a big difference doing it one way or the other, uh, as far as the end result. This really just comes down to the fact that, uh, when I got this in and got a hold of my steel supplier, he was able to get me a, a piece of hard ox, uh, and throw it in the truck and get it here pretty much, uh, right away. And it was a big enough piece of plate that I could do everything I needed to do down here and up there. So I'm just doing everything with, with that piece of steel. Uh, it's going to be fine. And we're going to get rolling on that. Uh, and we'll take a look at this later. Superpowers activate. Used to be a guy named Adam on a show called Mythbusters. He would talk about how a lot of times they had tools and materials being used in ways for which they were never intended. 
And then there's this guy, Andy, on a YouTube channel called Andy's Little Homestead. And that guy says that if it looks stupid, but it works, then it's not stupid. Is there something about guys with a A as the first letter of their name that makes them come up with good things to say? I don't know. Well, like you've probably seen there, I got out the old Commander 300 and was carbon arc gouging with it there, cutting this apart. Uh, there's nothing wrong with my inverter. Normally working in the shop, I'd, I'd arc gouge with that inverter. The old Commander, she just wanted to come out and play. She ain't forgot how to arc gouge. This is the original OG NBS welding machine that I bought 22 years ago. And she ain't forgot how to arc gouge. She ain't forgot how to burn rods either. We're going we're gonna to do some welding with the old girl. Yeah, let's do it. Hell, Becker, yeah. Got her filled in with some 316, 7014. I started out in pipe range, fourth gear on the Commander at 200. I ended up turning it down. I'm at 182 now. So for my next trick, I'm going to put that Commander pipe range 5th gear, get out some quarter inch jet rod, max it out at 300 and let her eat. It's ought to get her rolling cold. Give you an idea what a quarter inch jet rod will do. That's one rod. What a whale. Counterweight. On these wear bars I'm repurposing. Uh, I ran a track machine down the long runs of the cuts. Uh, I ran a scarfing tip on the end here 
and you notice I, I left a little bit of metal right here on them. Um, you got to think if you want to use a track machine, you got to watch how you cut stuff. Because I could have took that track machine and run it all the way down through there. But then this assembly, it would have fell apart. You know, if it falls completely apart, you got nowhere to put your track. So, you know, I can leave a little metal on the end there like I did and keep the whole thing in one piece. And then I'll just take my hand torch and do a little waha. And that baby, you know, she'll come apart. Now... The way I would want to cut this the rest of the way apart would probably be just on the forks. On the forks on a forklift. Because with the forks under here, you know, all the pieces are going to stay on the forks. You wouldn't have to worry about it falling apart like you do on these jacks. Um, but the jacks made it really good, you know, for setting this up. Because, you know, I got this down low and that up high. And the jacks would do that no problem. Now, the forklift... I use the most, of, the girl that does most of the lifting around here is the old shyster. And in the middle, right in the middle of this job, old shyster, the shyster got a flat is my problem with it. And um, I took a, I took the wheel off and I run it up to the tire shop. But the, the tire shop's only got one guy that works on forklift tires and he's out sick. So we're going to be waiting on that. But... I didn't have any trouble getting the wheel off and part of the reason I didn't have any trouble getting the wheel off if you see here the last time I had that wheel off I anti-seized them studs like a good cracker see if you do that you won't have trouble getting stuff apart but since the old shyster is 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 missing a wheel right now that's going to require the deployment of old Alice the camel the old Alice Chalmers she's a beast you know, she's got the, she's got the two, Alice the Camel's got two big humps. You know, you crank on this thing, you say, go, Alice, go. Alice is like, you know, she's like a fat country girl. I mean, you know, she's, she's not pretty. And she's loud. But she's got a good heart. You know, that's everything. Well, so, we'll take the parts we want to use, put the rest of it in the scrap bin. I'm glad my hound dog wasn't out here when I done that. He hates shit like that. That would have scared him to death. He'd be all the way crossing the county line howling by now. Well, now with all of these wear bars in place, I uh, turned and seen what we had left of the hard ox plate, and this is it. Um, so what I did, I made a little rectangle pattern for the old track torch that's uh, 
of a size that we can get several pieces out of that little piece of hard ox that's left and those would be a good way to use up the rest of that hard ox and uh, make us some corner wear plates because as you can see where this side wear plate is wearing out on the corner here you start to separate uh, some corner plates would would help that out quite a bit and that piece of hard ox is too small to do anything else with anyway um, so we'll burn those corner plates out and put them on there burn them out with the old pattern torch so let's do that So we've been rolling them plates around in the cement mixer full of nails for a little while. And they're cleaned up and ready to go. Weld them up. I really like how these these bars are on the on the corner of this bucket since there was quite a bit of wear at this corner trying to wear through. I think those little plates are going to do a lot of good work right there. Uh, got them on there. Took the solid wire MIG and filled the, filled up all the gaps there. Uh, still a lot of welding to do on that. And I think what I'll do, I've got some uh, 532nd hard face. And I'll put, that, I'll put that hard face here on this corner. Um, so you'll have the hard ox, the hard, the hard ox wear bars and a hard face on the corner would be really good. And if we look right here, obviously there's a lot of welding to do on these bars, but if right here is where my new hard ox plate splices to the old repair plate that somebody had put inside of that bucket previously. Um, and inside of here, in this area, is the old plate that they plated over. 
that they left in there. Uh, like I say, I'm not crazy about the way they played it over and left that in there, and we know that there's a gap between those two and it fits poorly. Um, but what we do know now, you know, there was a bunch of this kind of Mickey Mouse looking crap right here, and I've welded over all that and solidified all that, and that ties the repair plate that they had put in to the plate that they plated over and to this bar all the way across. So on this this part of the bucket, we know now that that's all tied together. And you remember down here where I had blown through and plug welded that and tied that together. You know, we got a, we got a good hold on it here. We got a good hold on it here. Still got a bunch of their Mickey Mouse crap in between here. But with that being uh, in the center of that, you know, do I need to fill all that in? I don't know. I don't know that it would really uh, add a lot to the integrity. It'd be nice to do that, but I don't know if it's necessary. When this thing's in use, most of this area right here, it'll probably just be filled in with uh, earth and rock and, and it'll get packed in there and it'll just kind of be covered up uh, but with that that previous repair plate in there knowing that it's plug welded and tied in here and knowing that it's tied in really well here uh, I think we're going to be pretty good with that uh, we just don't need any more of this Mickey Mouse crap and uh, there's a lot of welding to do and I'm going to get to doing that welding. And there's not going to be any Mickey Mouse shit. Before I get started welding on this bucket, let's take a look real quick the uh, way I'm set up here. I'm going to be welding on the inside of this. I got it in the position I want it to, uh, to do this inside welding. And of course, I'm in the bucket. So I've made sure that I've got everything set up everything I need I can reach everything I need and uh, one of the things that's real handy I'm running off the commander and I'm using the remote so with this remote uh, I can operate the amperage I've got two different size rods I'm gonna be running but I can manipulate right there I've got that commander turned clear down to 30 amps and right here on this remote, I can turn that thing completely up to, uh, you know, 375, wide open. And, uh, you know, a, a remote for your machine, it's not really something that you absolutely have to have. But when you get to the point where where you can get one you'll you'll find it really nice now another thing about welding in a bucket like this is air quality um there's going to be a box fan that's going to be blowing over top of the bucket i've got a my six inch air vac is set up over there and i got the hose right here 
it's going to be sucking uh, sucking smoke out of this bucket. I've also got my two inch blower. It's going to be this thing's powerful. It moves a lot of air. This thing's going to be blowing down in there on me now. Air quality is important for your safety, obviously, because welding is going to create a lot of fumes that you shouldn't be breathing. But uh, something like this blower is a really nice thing just for your overall comfort. I mean, it's hot today. We're, we're talking it's 80, 90 degrees. You get in a bucket like this and start welding, you're, you're going to be uh, suffering some high temperature situation. And um, having something that moves a bunch of air blowing at you is definitely comfortable. And that brings up, that brings up a point about sticker wire, which I guess... You know, if you were comparing stick welding to wire welding, one of the things that you would need to consider about running the stick, uh, I can blow as much air as I want into this bucket and it's not gonna affect this welding. Now, another great way to do welding like this and get it done really efficiently would be to run a dual shield wire like say an ultra core. If you were running an ultra core wire uh, in a diameter of like 1 16th of an inch, you could really get some welding done in a hurry on something like this. But here's the thing. That wire requires that you blow a shield gas through a gas cup onto the weld. And if you're doing that, you can't blow air and suck air like I'm doing here. It'll blow that shield gas away and it'll destroy that weld. So, you know, in that scenario, you would probably need to be, honestly, you should be wearing a papper device. If you're running a whole lot of wire that big, uh, I, I would highly recommend using a papper. Now, I own a papper, and I, it's a Miller papper. It works great. I really like it. I don't use it all the time because, like now, I'm going to be stick welding this. I'm going to be moving a lot of air. I'm going to be backing out the, the smoke. I'm very comfortable with just... Uh, what i got set up here and doing it that way so that's just a quick note on that and let's get to it so if you're not familiar with what <clears throat> high deposit welding rods will do Those five welds across there is 11 welding rods. Would have been 10, but that top one took a little extra just the way it fit up. So I went to put the side cutters on and when I got them up here there was a void behind them. I got a picture of it. I'll put that on there. So you see that void behind the side cutter. You know, the side cutter's got this flat spot where it's supposed to it's supposed to rest against this, but this has been worn enough that there was a void behind there. So I went outside and I found this strip of hard ox left. I didn't think there was any left, but there was this one little strip like an inch and three quarter wide. And I was able to cut these bars. So I've got some hard ox plates and I had to notch this out to get it in there right. But I've got some hard ox plates now that I'm going to weld in behind there so that cutter, see that cutter will be setting against that iron like it should be instead of just counting on the shear strength of the bolts. So I'm going to weld those in. Got those plates welded in behind those side cutters.
And this thing, that's that's all of it, man. This is done. Did quite a bit of welding and some hard facing on those sides. Hard ox blocks on the sides with hard facing over those. This is going to help a bunch where these where these sides were worn, because the rest of the side of this, with all that hard facing that was done previously, you know, it's pretty good. Maybe needed those plates in behind those cut those side cutters, but other than that, it's pretty good. When I welded in the plates, I did from here. Uh, I went ahead and welded that again too, just for good measure. So that's the end of that four foot bucket job, all done. Moving on to the next one.